special quick edition update briefing today it is Wednesday the 28th of March my name is Juan Brown this is Scott Purdue from the Flywire channel we're gonna go over the open public docket from the NTSB of the B-17 mid-air collision that occurred in Texas back on which date uh, 12 November 2022 Scott in Dallas Scott Purdue, as you know, runs the Flywire channel. He's flown with the Commemorative Air Force before. He's got some great insight uh, as to this open public docket. The final report will be out soon now that the docket's out. So. Yeah. So we want to, well, we'll just get into it and review the collision. And right now, let me tell you, it does not look good for the Air Boss. So this is a Commemorative Air Force show called Wings Over Dallas. Wings Over Dallas. And and as this is basically the grand finale of the show, um, and we've got a parade of aircraft featuring four bombers in this order, a B-17, an SB-2C, a B-24, and a B-25. We have three fighters, a P-51, two P-51s, and the P-63. It was the P-63 that had the mid-air collision with the B-17 in a crossover maneuver that in our opinion shouldn't have shouldn't have been shouldn't part have of the even show. happened it wasn't briefed and it shouldn't have happened correct so looking at the setup here this is runway three one runway one three at uh redbird what's the, the proper Dallas name Dallas executives what they call it now but old old timers call it redbird and here's the crowd over here here's the 500 foot line from the crowd which is basically the inside edge of runway three one here's the 1000 foot line a thousand feet away from the crowd and the mid-air collision impact or the initial collision was here over the freeway and the final impact was right about in here now the uh, uh we have pictures that we'll show you in a little bit but the b-17 impacted pretty much uh the impact debris uh was pretty much lined up on the thousand foot line very close to it and the uh, p-63 was closing on the 500 foot line here so these aircraft were technically not in a formation flight. They were chasing each other around in a trail mm -hmm. formation. Correct. And this is a, a kind of a parade of flight that the parade itself is a fairly common activity, right? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, typically how you put big airplanes like this, uh, you, don't, you don't want to fly them, you don't fly them in fingertip, you know, they're not going to be en route. Uh, the, the closure rates, et cetera, are very challenging and uh, hard to detect and hard to fix because they're not very maneuverable airplanes. So typically you employ these in trail. So you put them in trail, what would you say the distance between the aircraft typically are? Uh, I would say somewhere between 1,000 and 2,000 feet uh, normally. I don't know what they were in this case. There was actually a pretty big string between uh, the B-17, the SP-2C, and then the B-24. I don't know exactly about the B-25. The ADSP showed a little bit of it, but I think the B-25 was in better position on the 24. And so we'll show you a series of pictures as we talk. I'll throw the pictures up uh, and explain it. But they're going to do a series of dog bone patterns where they're going to fly out to a 9270, come back, and 9270, and keep cr crossing in front of the crowd, right? That was the, that was the basic plan. It didn't work out just quite that way. Mm -hmm. The first pass was this way on the crowd. Or it wasn't necessarily the first pass, but the first pass in this sequence of events. The bombers are going this way, and they do this dog bone turn with a left 270 and then, a, a, I mean, a left 90 and a right 270. This way, the fighters are taking off on 3-1. They come out here and then come back across the field and then join this here and they're in trail with the bombers. And then what happens is they get to midfield here. 
the uh, air boss calls for a racetrack and they set up a right racetrack right here and then they start this the incident pass of a right 90 followed by the 270 back around so it's that's the we call it, when i was swimming it basically we call it dog bone pattern. dog bone pattern uh okay so we have a morning briefing the <clears throat> the overall big picture is briefed as far as times and aircraft and pilots but this exact choreography is not briefed in the briefing this exact choreography is is brought up on the fly on behalf of the air boss yeah and as we see in the interview we'll go through some of those things is he basically said that's what he, he does he he does it on the fly situational dependent you know and uh and um basically he sells uh, he sells all the pilots down the river by saying that deconfliction is their problem when he sets up the conflict then he, he tells them, oh, yeah, this guy's there, this guy's there. And then he just washes his hand, hands of the actual de deconfliction problem. And, uh, and I, says it's up to the pilots. He says it's up to the pilots. And that, to me, is really problematic because he's put them in a position where there's conflicting flight paths. And, uh, and he's on to the next thing. He set them up for disaster. Remember from our previous briefings, uh, uh, you never, ever go belly up to another airplane like this because this airplane cannot see him. This is why in air racing, you never pass on the inside. You always have to pass on the outside because you cannot see. And this is exactly the case that the air boss set him up, set them up for. And from his location right here versus this turn inbound, this air boss cannot see the... He separation. Didn't have, he, yeah, he didn't have a perspective to actually see what the the separation was between the flights. Uh, the, the the fighter stream was uh, a little bit higher. The fighter parade, if you want, that already gone into trail was a little bit higher altitude, but not much. And everybody was up about a thousand feet ish, and then they're descending in this turn back to around two hundred eighty feet where the impact happened right here. And the fighters are supposed to catch up, but the Mustangs are just here ahead of the B seventeen, but the P sixty three wasn't. And he can't see that lateral deconfliction issue right here. He just called it out to the various leads and let it up, left it up to them. So not only are they flying this complicated dog bone pattern, but they're also climbing and descending a little bit in this pattern as well. And they're working on their, trying to work on their spacing. They're trying to work on their spacing. And you can see at least the SB2C is trying to, a little bit of cuff because he's got more spacing than he should. So he's trying to gain back some distance on the lead B-17. And so what's clear in the interview with the NTSB with the various pilots, the surviving pilots, is that they are very, very busy, primarily locked into their interval. They are following the aircraft ahead of them, and they are not, they don't always have the entire situational awareness of the location of all the other aircraft. You have a lead aircraft in each formation. The, that's not correct. You have a lead aircraft in each parade, the B-17 and the lead P-51. They're responsible for getting lined up on the correct track, but the other aircraft are simply following the aircraft ahead of them and do not necessarily know where the bombers are versus the fighters. So the bombers are working as a package and the fighters are working as a separate, separate package. package, separate group, essentially. Mm -hmm. Although the air boss does say in his interview that they're one formation and he considers them one formation, which I think is absolutely incorrect. He doesn't. Because the speed differential is huge. A big, big airplane like that, uh, so a smaller airplane like a fighter can fly formation, close formation on a big airplane, but not vice versa. Because the speed differential is just too head, too huge, and the performance characteristics of the airplane, and so the the uh, fighters were a lot faster. Typically, they should have been at a higher altitude than the than the uh, bomber stream and maneuvering above them. In this case, he's bringing them both down to the low altitude regime, which is no lower than 100 feet, somewhere between three, uh, 100 and 300 feet, and he's crossing. The, the fighters to the 500 foot line, and, and that's a direct quote from uh, the radio. And that's a ridiculous setup. Uh, we just don't understand why he would decide to do this, where he would move or have, and the bombers were set up, land in the B-17 was set up exactly as was um, requested to be on this thousand foot line, and then have the fighters who are inside of the bombers crisscross over and pick over, pick up the 500 foot line closer to the crowd. So you're 
crisscrossing aircraft without altitude deconflation. There, there was Confliction. no altitude deconfliction. The, the, I'd say oh, the whole bomber stream was doing exactly what they should be doing, trying to fix their spacing. And uh, the B-17 was trying to turn the line up on a thousand foot line. He was in about a 10 degree bank when the impact happened. So he was very close to the thousand foot line. He's doing what he's supposed to be doing. He's, he's clear as far as he could see, and he could see the Mustangs ahead of him, but he couldn't see the P-63. But that's not really his job to do that. And as far as Craig and the P-63, I think he was doing his job as he was trying to, trying to maintain visual on uh, the Mustangs ahead of him. Everybody's thinking that the air boss had choreographed, and that's to me, that's what it was. He's like a conductor at an orchestra. Mm -hmm. He's making all this stuff happen. And the, the workload is really, really high for every pilot. Not only the pilots in trail, but for the leads as well. And I think, in my opinion, they were pretty much doing their job. And I don't think Craig had that, you know, if, if he had, there was actually a study on visibility, uh, whether and when he could have seen the B-17. And from the visibility study, there was only about a, about a five second window where he would have been able to see the B-17, and that was here in the window. And he was looking, he was looking up here at the, his, his next in line, the second line. Right, he's looking out ahead. So who is this air boss? First, we look at all these uh, pilots here. These are some of the most experienced pilots you could possibly get for the commemorative Air Force. Uh, and in general, these are mostly retired Pilots or airline pilots, professional retired professional pilots, twenty thousand hour plus. I said the majority pilots. are probably retired yeah, professional. Pilots. Formation qualified, uh, air show qualified. Been doing this for years. Been flying these aircraft for years. What about the air boss? This air boss is the son of an air boss that had been doing this show for many years. So yeah, he was this. He was uh, uh, Russ Royce, Russell Royce, was the air boss here, and he'd done. He'd been doing several of the. CAF air shows, which is their big air show in Midland, dating back to the Midland days, and then moved, when it moved here to Dallas, uh, he was the son of Ralph Royce. And Ralph Royce uh, is a air, longtime air boss. He was actually president of the CAF for a while. He was uh, uh, the president of the Lone Star Flight Museum for mm -hmm. a while. And uh, my, the first show I flew with Ralph was in '96. Mm -hmm. I want to say. Then we look at Russell's uh, um, resume. And he's a private pilot, single engine land. He says he's got 1,800 hours, but that's it as far as flying experience goes. He's not formation qualified. He's not prior military. He's not uh, as far as we know, professional pilot. Not a professional pilot. He hasn't flown warbirds. He did have a tower operator certificate, but he only worked for what two years? Two years at Meacham, Air at Meacham Airport. And his day job today is working at a body shop. Yes, uh, that's yeah. his. That's his day job. And so, and he, that is the air boss is the guy that's in charge of all this orchestration of the aircraft. And we're just baffled at the, well, there was confusion out there on the flight line of the day of the accident there, there, and nobody during the briefings really raised their hand and expressed a concern as to what exactly the plan was they during didn't, the briefings. They didn't do that in the briefing. And this is a trend and the, the, apparently it's a trend in the Royces and how they do air bossing. Mm. As they start, they, they, I don't, can't date back when this started, but they, they try to or orchestrate this so it's a much busier show, condense uh, condensed uh, all the activity, the orbit activity into a, a tighter, more busy stream. And uh, two weeks previous, I think it is, uh, at Houston, Wings Over Houston happened, and Ralph was the air boss there. And they had two incidents that I think that come out in the interviews with the people who were flying on this day. They were also flying wings over Houston. And uh, there's two incidents that are big. And one is, is in one instance, this is unbriefed. They didn't brief it in the, in the briefing. It's or just orchestrated. It worked out as they had the bomber stream coming this way. And then an ME-262, which is a German jet, um, going the opposite direction, a couple of hundred feet below the bomber stream. Mm -hmm. And, one of the pilots says, hey, that's cool, but this is not normal kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. you know, he's a little, oh, there's a lot of trust here. Um, you know, that they've got the altitudes right. And the other one was they had, I believe it was, a, I believe it was the B7, a B-17 and then a C-47. And uh, Airbus directed a Mustang to go through them at their altitude, same altitude. And they had 2,000 feet of separation. 
and he went right through him at speed, you know, 90 degrees. And that to me is like, I, I, I just, I'm, and nobody, is a nice way to put it. And nobody said anything about it at the time. As far as it we didn't know. come up in a debrief, as far as we know. So this is what we call, and this is what the NTSB did such a great job of trying to peel back the layers of the onion normalization of deviance, right? This is what it is. Yeah. So here we see the beginning of a change up to the normally safe patterns that these guys normally fly as directed by this air boss. And the, 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 the issue here is, is, in my view, is, is he's orchestrating this. So what the pilots are doing is, is putting their trust in him to deconflict. Okay, mm -hmm. since they don't have altitude deconfliction, uh, they don't have distance, you know, the line deconfliction, he's crossing the lines, then they're trusting on him to make sure that it works out. His perspective from the very beginning means that he did not have the perspective to, to ensure separation. And he put them in a conflict situation, and they're trusting to him, and the workload is very high. I want to stress how, how hard everybody's working here to do what he's telling them to do to try to make it a success. And he's telling them on the radio, hey, it should work out, that's looking good, all this kind of stuff. And in, and in reality, that's not happening because he did not do, he did not take care of uh, the, the deconfliction for the flight paths. And, but he assumed, I mean, the, the, in such a way he's talking and directing things, I think they made an assumption, we know now is erroneous, but I think they're putting this, their faith in him that he knows what he's doing. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry to say, he does not. This is this is a disaster. I think the CAF guys are doing what they should have been doing in that situation. I'm not crazy about crossing flight paths. No. But uh, they put too much faith in the in the Airbus. Let's uh, take a look at the transcript um, of the actual incident and some more pictures. And another thing, there were two ride airplanes that were in the area at the time of the accident that technically were not supposed to be giving rides during the show. What two aircraft were those? There was uh, two airplanes. There was a T-34 that was coming in to land just as the fighters were getting ready to take off. Uh, that was doing a ride, and he landed. Uh, no conflict there. Uh, that was about, I want to say, uh, two and a half, three minutes before the impact happened. And then there was a steerman coming in to land. And you can actually see the Stearman landing just seconds prior to the impact. So, so a lot of crap going on right there. Yeah. And I can't see how that didn't affect situational awareness. Okay, we're going to break down the transcript here and bring up the points of um, confusion. First off, we get the ride airplanes down. There's also a B-29 that's going to be the grand finale at the end of this show. He's just taxiing into position. And... Scott's broken this down in time, so we're two minutes and 17 seconds from impact, and we're going to go through this entire dialogue. So starting at uh, 217, B-17, this is Airbus, Airbus says, B-17, after this pass, right 90, left 270. That's, that, this is the racetrack, which was ad hoc. They just made it up. They finished the racetrack. Now he's calling for the right 270, or right 90, left 270. This, this end of the dog bone, the accident pass. B-17 answers, Raiders, right dog bone. At 2.03, Airboss says, Fighters, you can walk up to the B-17. I'm going to break y'all after this. What does that mean? Well, What kind of terminology is that? <laughs> that is a, that's a totally made-up terminology. Um, so when you're talking on the radio, it's different from when you're talking like we are right here. You know, and you, you're seeing somebody and you're talking, you talk real fast. And our brains can interpolate that. When you're mm -hmm. listening on the radio, it doesn't happen that way. You have to use common terminology and you have to speak slower because the radio doesn't work well on transmitting fast. Clear and concise, Clear and concise. communication. And, and all of that walk up to the fighters, it's like, what the hell is that? Exactly. I don't know what that is. And break, y'all? So when I think of a break, I think of a, okay, so we're flying like this, we're flying like this, and then we break. But that's not what he's talking about at all. So there's the there's source of confusion. Then the Airbus says, you're going to end up breaking left. Airbus. So you're going to follow the bombers to the right 90 out, then roll, then you're going to roll back to the left and be on the 500 foot line. So he's telling the fighters to get on the, so this that's the crisscross. That's the crisscross. To the 500 foot line. If y'all want to set up an echelon right for a break, 
so y'all can get in trail. So that means he's going to crisscross the five the fighters over to the 500 foot line and then break them off to the right. It sounds like that's what he wants to do. Yeah, uh, I think, but they may not be what he's doing because he's saying break. And I think what in his mind he's saying is what he wants to do is not follow that doggone path that the uh, bombers are flying, but to follow the 90 and then do a hard turn left to get in front. So in other words, to truncate this turn and use the speed advantage to get in front of the bombers so they can make that cross happen. And that cross, that, the doggone's happening down here, and then the impact actually happened here. So they had not completely cleared the fighter stream parade in front in trail of the bombers. And did not get in front of the bombers. Right. Okay, the P-51. Okay, uh, say again for fighters, that was not clear. It's massive confusion. Massive confusion right here is he didn't, he didn't, you know, all this talking, he's talking real fast. I'm trying to keep up and it's like, what, what the hell did he say? Yeah, what are we doing now? And he's, he's by himself in the airplane, so there's nobody sitting next to him. Said, did you hear what the hell he said? No, I didn't. You know, it, it didn't exist. So he's saying, say it again because I don't know. So that would be the lead P-51 who's in charge of That's the guy flying the gunfighter. Pack. He's going, I don't understand you. And the worst part about what happens next is he says something completely different. The Don't Airbus. Just said. Okay, the Airbus says, uh, fighters go echelon uh, right. Go echelon right. Now what? That's an echelon. Yeah, so it, if if you were thinking about break you all out and then it's to the right, then it really should be an echelon left because you're going to break this way. If you're echelon right, then you can't break in front of the guy in front of you uh, that's on your right. So, But he called for trail too. So... What does he want me to do here? Yeah. Is it an echelon, which is a close formation thing, or is it in trail? The fighters ended up going in trail, but um, what he's, it, he sets them up right, and that would be a far hard left turn. So an echelon right means he can turn them harder to the left. You can't turn right or shouldn't turn right into an echelon. Right. So clearly the Airbus has no formation background. Okay, so Airbus says, uh, fighters, go echelon all right. Go to echelon right. P-51, okay, fighters, echelon right. Airbus, B-24, give me a couple inches and close the gap. B-17, keep the turn a little flat. I'm not sure what flat means. Maybe that's a shell or bank angle. So you, he, he ends up doing the, the uh, ends up on the thousand foot line further away. I mean, further out. I don't, I'm not really sure. It's confusing, is my point, is there's a lot of room for interpretation here. And who's in charge of spacing here? And and in the in all of his testimony, the Airbus says the pilots are in charge of spacing. But here is the Airbus directing, directing spacing. Him. Yeah, he's micromanaging power settings for the bombers. Airbus, just a little bit. When you come back through, you're coming through the 1,000-foot line. So that's the clear evidence that he's crisscrossing the bombers and fighters. Bombers on the 1,000-foot line, fighters to cross in front of without altitude deconfliction to the 500-foot line. And the bombers were on the 1,000-foot line pretty much the whole time. The whole time. They were doing what they were, should have been doing. B-17, roger. Airbus, fighters should be in a right turn. You're going to follow the bombers out on the 90 and then going to roll you back in front of them. So, so that's putting the... The fighters are turning a tighter inside line of the bombers. That's actually happening right about here when they're still in the right turn. Mm -hmm. So he's trying to direct it before it starts here. And you know, they're in a right turn and he wants them to roll left and not making a hard left turn to truncate that dog bone pattern for the for the fighters. Airboss, Quebec, I need you to drop down to the deck, runway 3-1, clear to land. Who's Quebec? Quebec is the uh, steering that's uh, coming in to land uh, uh, right here. He's, he's uh, inbound to land here. And the B-29 is right here waiting to take it off up. at this point in time. So the, the PT-17 is steering to come in here from the right, uh, or what we're looking at right here, uh, to land on 3-1, and he ends up wanting to land short here and then taxi off. So again, a right aircraft in the middle of a show, not a good combination. And in the pictures you're going to see here in a second is the impact happens uh, between the airplanes. They're right here, and the steering is right here. The, the camera is actually up here looking down this way, 
so you can still see the stirring in the frame. A lot of stuff happening here when there shouldn't be. We're down to the last minute prior to impact. Um, so Airboss directs the Stearman to land, and the Stearman says, down to the deck, 5'8 Quebec. Airboss, there you go, B-17, a nice, gentle flat. Roll it around to the 1,000-foot line, B-17. 1,000 foot for the Raiders. So, so Len and his crew knows that they are lining up for it, and they did line up on the 1,000-foot line, exactly where they're supposed to be. Airboss, fighters, roll it back left. Lead fighter, lead roll it back to the left, and y'all get in. What's that? I don't know what that is. <laughs> Y'all get in? I don't know. Get in what? Yeah. Get in what? Uh, is this get trail? In. Is it this? Oh, trail? here it is. Get in trail. All right. I missed that. Fighters, roll it back to the left. Lead fighter, roll it back to the left, and y'all get in trail. So they get, I'm just getting the fighters in trail in a left-hand turn. And that, and that actually might be that whole echelon right thing, and in that direction might be one of the reasons why the P-63 had a little extra spacing on the Mustangs, because there's a lot of stuff happening to do something different. And the Mustangs are off here, and now he's, he's spit out a little bit mm. in that turn. And then the, the lead P-51 responds, okay, fighters in trail, air boss. Yeah, and gunfighter, look left side and see B-17, P-51. Yeah, we see the B-17. So the lead Mustang sees the B-17, but what about the rest of the fighters? And they're hanging off. They're, they're, flying, hang they're flying in trail. And they are and, focused and, on the aircraft ahead of them. And, and how can you, how can you deconflict, because they don't have out of deconfliction, so they have to have lateral deconfliction. How can you do that when you have a stream of airplanes in trail? The lead can't see anybody behind him. Mm -hmm. So he's, he's trying, I'm trying to set it up, and it probably looked okay for him when he's doing this that he might have spacing, but he didn't know how far three was behind him mm. to see if that flight path was going to deconflict. So that's, that is the issue is everybody basically relied on the air boss who assumed it. I mean, he assumed authority. You listen to what he's saying and how he's saying it. The authority is there. I'm in charge. Do it this way. I'm controlling every movement of the airplanes. But, hey, if you hit each other, it's your problem. So the, the lead P-51 says he acknowledges the B-17 at 49 seconds to impact, at 48 seconds. Air boss, yeah, there you go. Roll it back to the left. I want you to go in front of the bombers. I want you to come through on the outside edge of the runway. Which is actually a little bit on the corner of the diagram I've seen. The 500 foot line is there, so if the outside edge would be here, there. he's actually now they have less lateral deconfliction between the flights, mm -hmm. so that's a little bit confusing as well. So, there's a lot of different terminology, made up stuff. You know, you got to interpolate what's going on, and, and now what is the 500 foot line? Is it here? Is it there? And again, none of this delicate choreography was pre briefed, no, it's all situational. At 43 seconds, the P-51 acknowledges okay with that last command from the air boss. 34 seconds, air boss. Wind check, estimated 330, 12 gust 18. Air boss, nice job fighters, you're coming through first. That will work out B-17 and all bombers on the 1,000 foot line. And I think that's a critical comment there because... They're trusting the both flight leads, the bomber guy and the fighter guy, are trusting he is cross checking what the clear what the the separation is, and he just told them it's great. He gave them the warm fuzzy that they were all clear. That's in my opinion, that's the way they interpreted it. Of course, there's no way of knowing it, but I I, I feel pretty confident that I would have interpreted it that way if I was in their place. It is okay. He, he says it's working out. Great. So I'll just keep following my lead P-51 and get on that 500-foot line and keep what I'm doing, doing what I'm doing, and everything's going to work fine. And uh, in, in his interview, he actually says, you know, what I do is I call him out, and then I'm on to the next thing. So because of what he said there, I think he said that here, uh, and, then, and he said in his interview, I think when his thinking is he set it all up, so he's thinking about the next maneuver, which is what's going to happen down here. The fighters are going to break out. Possibly, and then he's going to take off the V-29. So he's on. He doesn't even give a care anymore. He washed his hands of it. He figures that the spacing, the pilots are working out the spacing. At the same time, the pilots are relying on the Airbus to boss to have achieved the desired spacing. 20 seconds before impact, Airbus. B-17, you got fighters in front of you off to your left. Well, that wasn't the case. 
Well, if not all of them, he had to... The P-63 was still behind. The P-63 was still behind his 3-9 line. The 3-9 line is, if you just look at the clock, you mm -hmm. know, you have 3 o'clock and 9 o'clock out here. So it was, he was he was behind and catching up. And again, from this vantage point of the Airbus, he can't tell if the P-63 is ahead of or behind the B-17 because they're looking at each other like this. Yeah, pretty pretty close to being head on. With the, I mean, within probably about 30 degrees. But uh, that's hard to discern. The line of sight from the Airbus. 14 seconds prior to impact. Airbus, nice nice job, fighters. Come on through. 11 seconds. Airbus, fighters will be a big pull up and to the right. And that's when impact happens. Knock it off, knock it off, knock it off. Yeah. So when I, when I look through this transcript, um, the guy, the, uh, the fighter, uh, fighter lead and the bomber lead, they're not talking very much. They acknowledge stuff. But the air boss is almost nonstop. Talk. He's talking almost nonstop. And he's talking in terminology that's not standard. He's saying things and making up things. And, you know, so people are trying, they're hanging on. Yep. Trying to do what he's telling them to do, thinking that uh, he's clearing things and he's not. With no formation, formal training in his background, except for some prior air shows. Okay, let's look at some pictures. Okay. Okay, Scott, these are photos from the uh, NTSB docket, correct? These are uh, from the docket itself, and we can see the second Mustang there. There's the B-25. Uh, well, let's go with the order of the bombers. The order okay, of the bombers so in B-17, SP-2C, B-24, B-25. Uh, or no, that's the that's the uh, uh, the SP-2C. Yeah, that's there. okay. And then fighters, uh, three fighters. The lead fighter is already off the screen. Off the screen. To the right. That's the second. And here's the steering down here. The steerman landing down here, and of course, here's the P-63 approaching and unable to see the B-17 directly in front of him. Yeah, he's totally obscured now in his cockpit. That's another shot of, uh, of that, just slightly different, but showing the bank angles. This is a closer shot. Uh, they zoomed into it, and you you can see that the, the uh, B-17 is about a 10-degree bank angle, and the P-63 is about a 53-degree bank angle. And again, with that long nose on the P-63 and belly up to the B-17, he is unable to see him. Yeah, could not, he could not see him. And if he did, by the time he saw that left wing tip, it's just much too late. Another angle, and that's a zoomed in shot. Uh, zoomed in shot with the 24, so the SP-2C is down there. Mm -hmm. It's a much smaller airplane than these two big bombers. And this is the uh, debris field for the P-63. This is the uh, the gearbox and the nose wheel for the P-63. And then uh, the, the, the empennage with a little bit of the fuselage right there. And that, that well, let's look at the next slide here. It's approaching the 500-foot line, it looks like. It's just inside the 1,000, but not quite to the runway yet. Yeah. And this is the, this is the gearbox and the, the, the nose gear and what's left of the prop. And... Here is the uh, empennage and the fuselage. Various debris is here. Okay. This is the path of uh, debris path, basically, for the B-17, the tail, the uh, front part of the airplane impacted right here, and then the debris field uh, separated out like that. And this, So that puts him pretty much on the 1,000-foot line right over pretty, here. Pretty dang close to yeah. the 1,000-foot line. Doing exactly what it should have been doing. And so the initial impact was pretty much right over this frontage road uh, next to the freeway. Correct. Wow. So that's the, what carries it forward here is the momentum of the various parts right. as they separate it. And just another look, this is the tail. And uh, that's the, uh, the, what's left of the... Because it was literally um, ripped in half, the B-17. Yes. From the trailing edge on. And the P-63 again. Yeah. Next. And that's the path, the debris path for the P-63 with one of the first things that fell off of it. So the the uh, uh, propeller and uh, nose gear and gearbox, I think, are right there. And this is uh, perhaps one of the wings. I think one of the wings separated earlier. Yes, that's one of the wings. So, again, this is the runway. The 500-foot line was about along here. Yes. The 1,000-foot line out over here. And so you can, and the crowd is back up here. So I'm just off camera. see the crisscross uh, beginning there. That, that's the Raiders, the Texas Raiders in better times. Uh -huh. 
and this is the P63 King Cobra uh, in better times. And there were only two of these uh, that were made. They were test airplanes, and they never produced uh, the P63. There were only two. With the famous mid-mounted engine right here with the big drive shaft running through basically between the pilot's legs and then the nose here and then they ended up putting a cannon in it mm -hmm. to uh to fire through the nose of the airplane which was the whole idea of the design was to build a platform for a cannon that would fire right through the center yeah and the, the soviets uh, the russians actually used they loved this airplane as a tank buster because it's very easy to aim that cannon right off the nose and uh, uh take out tanks with it mm -hmm. it didn't prove to be uh, a very good air-to-air -air fighter, and part of it was the, the wicked stall characteristics because the of the mid-mounted engine. Mid -mounted engine. This is the actual path, uh, as shown the the all the chore choreograph of all this stuff. Okay, so um, the uh, there was a uh, he took off the fighters this way. They turn right and they climb out this way and then rejoin just after in trail of the dog bone that's happening out here on the northwest side of the crowd line, which is right there. They come back this way and then come back down the line. And uh, as they do this, they go into this racetrack pattern. The fighters. The fight, no, the everybody. Mm. And I think they they did that uh, to catch up, catch up everybody. Stand by. And this is the accident dog bone right here. As they come through here, the fighters are in trail trying to catch up. And then uh, they cut them in. Uh, he cuts them inside, breaks. He, uh, using the terminology, break instead of cut, using cut off to get ahead of them. Uh, and the impact happens here, and then the debris field is right there. What this shot, this slide shows is in purple are the bombers, and in the green are the fighters. And they were doing the bombers doing this dog bone pass, or getting ready to do it. And he took the fighters off on three one, and they did this right turn, and then came back around over the crowd this way. And then, uh, then by the crowd, and then in, into this dog bone as they're trying to catch up with the bombers, and they ended up in uh, following through the racetrack that the bombers were doing, and then into this uh, dog right dog bone that the, for the accident that the accident action actual accident happened in, and you can see is how they cut it off, but not significantly. And we've got another set of pictures here. This is all NTSP stuff on analysis showing where they were by airplane. And these are the paths of each individual airplane showing where they were. Um, and there's the 500 foot line and the 1000 foot line. And there's the lineup of aircraft right there. Yeah, and you can see where the, the two intersected, the B-17 and the P-63 in red, so the, the purple and red. So this is the overhead view of that. And you can see where the the collision. So they, they did not make that good of a turn. Um, so they're not, and they didn't have a big speed differential. One of the issues here is is the, the speed required for the 500 foot line. You can't go as fast as you can on the 1,000 foot line. So they weren't going over 200 knots. And the analysis they determined they were all doing somewhere around 180. So they didn't have any overtake. They had very little overtake and they didn't have geometry. To, which is what this cutoff should have given them mm -hmm. is a geometric advantage because the bombers didn't flatten out their turn enough. Uh, he didn't know what, and I'm sure the B-17 didn't know what the objective here was. Right. Uh, so, okay, I'll flatten out my turn. But um, what that did, did do is, is it didn't provide enough separation between the two. This whole thing was uh, just iffy, just yeah. really iffy. But you can see the air boss, his perspective... Mm is looking basically nearly head on. Right on the nose. Yeah, of everything that's going on. Uh, so anyway, this shows where the B-17 is and where the P-63 is and following the fighters as they come in the fighter group right here as they come around again. So we can see what the progress is. Here is the B-17. He's getting ready to start his dog bone right, uh, right 90. And the, must, the uh, fighters are clustered close together here. You can see the difference in the bomber stream. Okay, they're strung out pretty far. And uh, then the fighters go into trail here, um, start to go into trail. It just starts to happen here. The B-17 is here, and he's going to fly there. The B-17's there. The bomber trail is here. And now the fighters are in trail, and you can see there's a pretty good gap between the two Mustangs and the P-63. 
causing the P63 to be lagging. Uh, and uh, you can see he's going to lag a little bit further because he didn't react as fast as the Mustang did. But he's starting to catch up to and converge with the B-17. And this is a, a actual shot uh, from a video that uh, 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 somebody in the crowd took. And you can see the Mustang, the P-63, and the B-17 coming together. The Stearman is right here. The impact happens here, the Stearman is there, Stearman is here. So it's, that's the impact. So all that happened there, there's a lot of stuff going on, and that Stearman, uh, was it a factor to any one of these pilots? No. But was it a factor to the Airbus? Uh -huh. I would say yes. Uh -huh. Because there's a lot, distraction. Of, a lot of distraction going on, and he's off to the next thing. This is a look at... The uh, cockpit, I believe this is not a 63. It might be the P-63, but I, that's a silver airplane. I think that this may be one of the P-39s. Mm -hmm. But it shows you how blind it is with the um, tall cockpit, drive shaft between the pilot's legs, long nose, uh, helicopter-style bell doors, um, just a no, not a lot of great visibility. Yeah, all these things, it's surprising because yes. your head's right about there. So those really block out a lot. So mm -hmm. you might have this window here, but you can't contort your head down to look at that See window. See what's behind that line. Yeah. yeah. So those, all that, uh, the framing really reduces visibility considerably in an airplane like this. This was the, the uh, NTSB actually did a, used Microsoft Flight Simulator to simulate the flight paths and the visibilities that were available to the B-17 and the P-63. And that just shows you uh, what uh, the different areas uh, of windows that the pilot's looking through. Okay, and now he's looking through, um, as he's making his turn, where the B-17 is here, uh, when his, where he's looking is just off screen there. There's one of the Mustangs. So that's his lead, that's what he's following, that's what he's concentrating on. Yeah. And they're descending in this turn as well. They're descending in the turn. So this is a very brief point in time, just before impact, where he could have seen him in the canopy. The B-17. He could have, yeah, the P-63 pilot could have seen the B-17, which is right here in that side window. But that's actually uh, right about your, somewhere real close to your elbow. So why would you be looking there? This is where... Well, he's focusing on. He's focusing on his lead. Yeah. The, and that's actually the second Mustang. But that's what... That's his interval. That's his interval. Yeah. He's, he's following... He wants to fly the flight path, and he wants to keep his interval or close in a little bit. So that's what he's doing there. That's what he's trying to do. And the B-17 is a green B-17 against a green background. Yeah, so very hard to see. And uh, that's just another quick look at that uh, with the, the various airplanes in his line of sight here as he's closing. So that one was, yeah, this is a head just for impact. Just going into the impact, getting ready for the impact here. So he's he's about to bank up and lose that B-17 completely underneath his belly. Yeah. And then that's that's the B-17 picture there, uh, looking at the Mustangs. And I get, well, maybe the green is the second Mustang. So he was much lower than the, the lead Mustang. And this is the P-63 here. And this is looking way over your left shoulder, whereas, again, the crew of the B-17, they're looking ahead to hit their 1,000-foot mark. Yeah, they're pretty much... There might be somebody looking at the, the lead fighter right there, uh, but that's what they're looking at. So it's the B-17 with the fighters, the first two fighters passing him in front of him. Yeah, as he's just... This is just prior to impact, and uh, he's he sees the two fighters here. He doesn't see the P sixty three. If he was if he was looking for that, if he was looking for lining up on the, uh, he might have glanced at those and seen them, but uh, it didn't really register what the formation was and what it looked like, what the trail formation looked like. He was trying to concentrate on his thousand foot line, mm -hmm. which is right there. And that P sixty three is coming in right over his left shoulder. So the analysis said that uh, there was a brief few seconds just prior to impact where the crew would have been able to see the uh, uh, P-63 just beyond the wingtip as he comes behind the wing and then impacts right at the wing root. But the issue here is, is this is actually behind the pilot's shoulder. And it's so close to this point, there's nothing anybody can do at this point. The B-17 could not, it, it, it never been maneuverable enough 
to avoid that impact. And this is why you never go belly up to another aircraft in formation. You simply cannot see them. Yeah, you have to you have to deconflict altitude so you're looking up. You know, not in nearly the same plane. These guys are nearly the same plane, and uh, yeah, he 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 couldn't see him right there at the impact, and that's the impact. Well, so a lot of classic um, errors in this. We see normalization of deviance, going all the way back to the Houston show. We've got an air boss that's not current or qualified in formation procedures and is giving a lot of leverage as to what to do. Um, we've got aircraft that are going belly to belly to each other in direct violation of basic formation principles. What else do you see that the NTSB is the NTSB is going to hammer their typical things about SMS and risk assessments and that sort of thing? And what what what, they, what does the organization have along those lines? Uh, they do have SMS, and uh, um, they they actually made some pretty good changes after this accident. Mm. The CF did, which basically gives direction to CF pilots to not do the kind of not accept the kind of maneuvering that the Airbus gave them. And it's not, in other words, they're not allowed to do that. So if the air boss says, hey, I want you to do this, no, you didn't brief it, and you can't do that. Yeah, and what about briefings themselves? Uh, is there any uh, changes to that? Or are they more going to be have, have that, that choreography mm -hmm. more yeah. measured out? Um, yeah, I, I, so far, uh, I don't think the FAA has addressed that. That would actually be an FAA thing. In other words, what do they put in 80, 80 I think it's 8900.1, um, how to do the air show. Um, let's talk a little bit about the organization itself. You've flown for the Commemorative Air Force. Is there a um, is there a culture where you don't want to speak up because this is all volunteer and you want to uh, get the opportunity to fly these aircraft? What's the culture of not speaking up like? Um, so I haven't done air shows with the CAF in nine years or so, mm -hmm. so I can't really say um, what it what it was here. Uh, but what I do know is is that the you know none of these maneuvers were briefed at the at the air show briefing, and nobody really raised their hand and says, "Okay, what are we really going to do?" Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's kind of a it is that normalization of deviance. While we did it at West Houston or the Houston wings over Houston and so on, we've done it before. So that's kind of that's kind of how things are done, and. Uh, um, I can see how you can fall into a trap that way. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think there's any pressure, um, even now, you know, uh, to, uh, you, you can't speak up or something like that, you're gonna get in trouble. I don't think that exists. I think that everybody wants to make it happen. Mm -hmm. And that's the that's really the problem, I think, is, is we wanna put a good show together, we wanna do well, we wanna fit in with what the flow is, so that's what they're trying to do. and. That puts a lot on the air boss that he needs to be an adult and manage it well. And in this case, I think there's, uh, unfortunately, you read the interview with him, he comes off as having a pretty strong ego. And I don't think it's based on very much actual experience, you know, of, in, in airplanes. So he doesn't know what these planes can do mm -hmm. or what the workload for the pilots, mm -hmm. what he's telling the pilots to do, what kind of workload that imposes. And I, I think that's the real the real factor here. And uh, um, so the actual change, some of the changes that CF made to airship procedures is you you can, you say that, you know, but you look on the lookout for this stuff mm -hmm. and not accept it, not accept that kind of direction. And this particular air boss is no longer air bossing, I suppose. You know, I don't know that, mm -hmm. but his, uh, his air boss LOA was due and was not renewed. I, I would hope so. Yeah, yeah that's, that's the word I'm hearing. Okay, thanks so much, Scott Purdue, Dallas, Texas. Special uh, guest appearance here and a great overview of the disaster of the Wings Over Dallas Air Show back in November of 2022. Thanks so much for your perspective and insight on this. Okay, and we'll, uh, when the final comes out, we'll take a little bit closer look at that. Yep, it'll be really interesting to see what the uh, NTSB has on that. Thanks so much for your support, especially the folks over on Patreon that make this content possible. See you here. See you next time.